Hi, good afternoon. So um, we have uh, journalists and writers here. So um, is everybody all right if we resort to strong language and some um, impoliteness? Because it's very hard for journalists to be polite and sophisticated, as you know. Um, also, I'm going to make a request to them to break in frequently into one another's uh, observations so that no one is allowed a free uh, run of, of their own objection. mouth. <laughs> I disagree, Arunava. No, I have an objection. You said journalists and writers. So are you suggesting that journalists are not writers? I'm hoping to come to that conclusion by the end of the next 40 minutes. But you, you will have to help me. Right. So, you know, um, recently I had asked a journalist friend of mine to write a piece on whether journalists make good novelists. Because as you know, every journalist in India has one or three novels, written or unwritten. Um, you think of any novel that's come out written in English and every other book is by a journalist. So I asked this person, do, you, do journalists make good novelists? And he wrote a piece for me which unfortunately I cannot publish. But um, he started out by saying that uh, he once strolled into a newsroom with a friend and the friend point, you know, gestured out to the newsroom and said, look at them, every fucking hack here thinks he's Ernest Hemingway. So what's your response to that? Does every fucking hack think he's Ernest Hemingway? Can I quote Mark Twain? Mark Twain had actually once said that, you know, the trouble with the difference between literature and journalism is only one and that probably takes you where this is going. And he said that most, uh, uh, most, most literature is unread and most journalism is unreadable. <laughs> and I think that pop, you know, it's a facetious way of making the point because Mark Twain, of course, himself was a journalist. And, but in, in the Hemingway is a very good example in a way because, of course, the journalistic training helped him write with economy and write in a, in a sense in terms of space. And that made him to the kind of short story writer that he is. I completely but, disagree. Uh, I'll sorry. just cut in. Yes, yes. See. This is how I want uh, I think the primary uh, misapprehension that we've started to labor under, which we should clear out immediately, not all literature is fiction. Let's be honest. So if you're talking about Hemingway and he went on to write novels and everybody thinks he's a novelist, you can still be a non-fiction writer and write literature. Many people have. Uh, and so we are not saying you know, is a journalist going to at some point sit down and write a novel? That's not the arc that we should be examining. We should be examining whether journalism translates into a particular kind of non-fiction writing that can be considered literary, that can be considered literature. Okay, fair enough, and, and we should. So, Atish, what do you think? What is the difference between journalism and non-fiction literature? Um, a little bit also like a difference of locale. Like, I mean, I find that... Uh, the different traditions have, have been better suited. If I think of people like Yosa and Marquez, they were really proud of their journalism right to the end. And they were in noisier countries. The politics was more at the front of things. The, 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 the environment was not as settled as it has been in the latter part of the century in places like England and America. So I feel like, at least in an Indian role, there's a kind of relevancy about long-form journalism, about, about being closer to politics than there might be in other places. That makes okay. sense? Yeah, sure. But how does it... Is there a line you cross when you go over from journalism to literature, just in terms of labeling? Uh, I think that it's... I mean, it's... For, at least for me, it's always been an aspiration to keep both lives... I, I, what I feared more is that business of being... Uh, writing fiction for year after year, kind of spinning your guts, and that ability to like go out in search of material and to, for the journalism in some ways to inform a kind of personal growth. And then you come back to it with the imagination. And the imagination takes longer to process things, but you don't want to miss out on the world as it's going on. I mean, for instance, this election, it, it would have for, for me, as a, as a writer living in India, it would have seemed unconscionable not to be part of what was happening even as an observer, and you can do some journalism at that point. And I remember Philip Roth talking about 15 or 20 years. That was what he needed as a kind of processing. So that was the kind of time his imagination needed to come back to a current event, to make it into fiction. So, uh, but so we're still, but we're still, so you're still again going back to this notion that at some point the material that we find in journalism translates itself into fiction. 
There is, when you say imagination, do you I'm mean a political imagination or do you well, mean creativity? Well, I think, I think that uh, a certain kind of literary imagination for non-fiction which, uh, and, and you mentioned Hemingway and, so, well, Death in the Afternoon of course stands out and I would say that The Killings in Trinidad by V.S. Naipaul, very, very interesting example of non-fiction working better in a literary environment than than gorillas, which became the novel. So, uh, so certainly, like the what what I suppose that um, I, I think that there's the fictional imagination has a longer processing time. There is such a thing as like a literary non-fiction imagination, which can start working quite soon after an event. What do you think, Samant? You, you both of you. I'll ask both of you about the literary non imagination in literary non-fiction. So and at, what role it's played in your recent books? So at a very crude level, and uh, these classifications are always problematic, but one way I would look at the question of journalism and literature as in non-fiction literature, is that journalism, journalism is for the immediate and the short term, and literature is something you will probably read it a few years later, and that it might still carry a meaning. And the reason it would carry a meaning is that journalism would be about the facts, and the literature would be about the reality. And let me explain how I dealt with it as a reporter. I mean, I, I've just written a book on Bangladesh and the 1971 war leading up to what's going on today. Some of what I was doing was like reporting because of day-to-day -day events, because the Shahbag protests that are going on were happening in front of me while I was writing it. So it, was, it could have been like, uh, you know, so-and-so 19 studying at this university said this kind of reporting. But because I was writing it in a broader frame, which was informed by a lot of reading of others and their personal account, it had to be part of that flow. And I was constantly aware that just because I was seeing it in the here and now, it could not dominate the rest of the narrative. And I, I was always conscious that those whose first-hand accounts I was reading, or those whose memories I was relying on, must seem consistent with the tale that I was telling from today. What that meant was, of course, that there was an even flow, that was the advantage of it. But what, what it meant was that you had to be much more faithful to the broader reality of the story they were talking about and not details. Because as soon as you go for details and something that has happened a long time ago, people's memories play tricks. And you know, simple things like how many people died in the war. I mean, we talked about it a couple of days ago at my session. And uh, people have disputes about that. So if you were to be a forensic reporter investigating, you will not go much far because there's no evidence for that. So you have to take the reality beyond it, which is where I think literary techniques come in, where you talk about the gravity, gravity of a situation and build from that. I, um, I mean, I, there are some lines that are very easy to define. Uh, and I remember, uh, you know, reading a quote from David Remnick, who's the editor of The New Yorker, who says that line between fiction and non-fiction is very easy to define. If there is a single detail in an otherwise non-fictional piece that is made up, he counts it as fiction. And I find that very useful to remember when, if you've made up one thing, it starts to be fiction. So that's very easy. The, the line between journalism and literature is blurrier and when I, you know, the, the distinguish, you know, how I distinguish it in my own head is when I sit down to write a book or I, a long essay, it's the atmosphere that the story creates. If you can create a novelistic atmosphere, the kind of storytelling that is present in the best novels with sort of characters and scenes and developments within, within the book or within the essay that resemble you know, evolution, evolutions across novels or short stories and so on. If you can create that atmosphere, then it becomes more yeah. quote-unquote um, literary. To, to, uh, uh, we spoke for a second earlier about the killings in Trinidad. It begins with the description, I think, of a cutlass, which is the instrument that it's about the black power movement in Trinidad. And it ends with, the, with a woman that Naipo believes to have been sort of criminally naive and to have entered into this situation not knowing what she was. And in the end, she's almost sacrificed. She's killed with this, like, this instrument. And it begins literally with a description of this instrument and how easily available it is in Trinidad. And immediately, a mood of menace is set, a literary mood of menace, in something, in fact, that he can't replicate in the novel, but that, I, I, for, for being real, has, exerts an even more powerful impression on you. So another, I mean, we've talked about Naipaul and Hemingway, and I was just going to bring up Marquez here in that context. News of a kidnapping, you know, which is about the Escobar uh, episode in Medellin. Now, I was in Medellin for a human rights meeting, and I ended up writing a travel piece for Mint, as I tend to do. That's how I do this column in Mint. And 
it was interesting because, you know, what I was constantly, and then the thing is that when you get off at Medellin airport and go to the city, you go through hills and valleys, I mean, basically, and it's a completely dark highway and it's scary. It's night. And I had read an incident about once when Marquez himself gets off the airport to meet the people in Medellin and he sees a woman who's killed and, and a 16 or 17 year old and he gets into the car with the guy and asks him why. He said, we don't ask these questions. And then he writes and reconstructs her story and that becomes the chapter. And so I think what, what happens is that when the literary journalist actually approaches it and gets into the picture, that tends to, and, and the, the critical part about it, as, as Samant was pointing out, the quote from New Yorker, the fact and fiction part, which is where I want to bring in another element. And since we are talking about fiction as in, in, from a perspective of literature, is what Ramesh Gunasekara once told me, the Sri Lankan writer. He told me that you journalists have it much harder than we, because we can make stuff up, and you can't. And, 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 and he's right, because we can but lie. Most, most journalists. Uh, but like, most, uh, like we don't make stuff up. There are other journalists, I'm sure, who do. No, no. By, by journalism, let's not uh, confuse it with what we read in the papers every morning. Right. Are you talking Two about papers things. in particular? Or Except the Hindu, of course. Hindu. And the Mint. <laughs> and Mint, yes. No, but seriously, I think there's a point to it. And uh, again, the, once I was in the audience with Kamila Shamsi and Tami Manam uh, in London, because Tami had written her novel on Bangladesh. And I had found one tiny mistake in the book where she had named a cricketer wrong. In she a, named what wrong? A cricketer wrong. Okay. Because she writes about a cricket match in Bangladesh uh, when it was East yeah. Pakistan. And she calls him uh, Norman Foster, which is an architect. But it was Norman Gifford, the spinner. So Ooh. I told her about it, right? And, and so I said that how important, you're writing fiction so it shouldn't matter. So Kamila made a very interesting point that look, when that happened, for the next three pages, you stayed with that incident. And whatever Tamiba was trying to build up was lost. So in a sense that while fiction writers can make stuff up, they also have to be very that clear kind of, about that it. That kind of detail matters immensely. Yeah, yeah. Facts, right. Unless you're a suspect narrator like all Rushdie's narrators, you know, sure. who can you know, put the Calcutta riots after the independence and so on. Sure. But you, you made that point about uh, journalism being facts and literature being reality. So what, how do you bridge that gap from facts to reality? What comes in? What are the additional elements? Is it imagination? Is it technique? No, I think it's like, a, I mean, there's a reflection of a certain, you know, to sound extremely pretentious about it, but this is the kind of jargon that is used for novels, so we'll apply it here also, is that it speaks to deeper truths about the human condition and about existence and life. And so when you're writing about a war or when you're writing about sort of Bangladesh riots, I mean, as when you translate it into literature, there are certain sort of underlying basic emotions and truths about people that you get at, which are not necessarily accessible when you write an 800 word piece or a 1500 word piece. Uh, it, it is useful for journalists, I believe, and I think we don't do this in the country enough. Even if you are writing an 800 word piece, you try to have an arc, you try to tell a very short story, it's an extremely small story, but you still start off with sort of, uh, I mean, you still think of it as if you're sitting down across a table with somebody and saying, this is the story I heard the other day. So you still try to do that, and we don't try to do that enough. But when you start translating it at great length and great depth, this is what happens. You start speaking to not just the specifics of that particular situation, but to a broader, more universal kind of, of truth. But don't you think that the, that the writer, by attempting to decipher the larger truth, is so inserting himself or herself into the proceedings that it is automatically becoming a subjective rendition but and therefore you know, distancing itself from reality. No, on the contrary, it should emerge automatically. I mean, when you talk about, you know, for example, loss in Sri Lanka, as I did, people who have lost sort of loved ones to war or to, you know, to go away to join the tigers or taken by the army and so on. I mean, at some point, there are sort of unifying threads about how people deal with loss and about grief and about suffering. And these emerge, I mean, in one sense, it's very liberating because all you have to do is get all the small dots in the right place. And then you step back and the bigger kind of thing, the bigger picture just pops out at you. And, you know, you have to work at it a certain amount, but the, the liberating thing was that I had to just focus on getting the small details right, and the big picture would start to emerge. And besides, we don't want to edge out subjectivity. I think that as much as you would come to a writer of fiction for his way of looking, if you were writing literary nonfiction, that way of looking is tremendously important. So, I mean, as long as you can declare your subjectivity, as long as I think that that it's, 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 something that it's, it's something that becomes almost as interesting as what is being seen. Do you know? And, and, and a lot of writers will, th that, 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 the, the kind of, that, that, 
a, a certain kind of engagement in a non-fictional narrative, especially if it's difficult. For me, at least, like that, that becomes the really novelistic side of non-fiction, uh, of good literary non-fiction. Yes, yes. I mean, it's important, I think, when you're writing literary non the, the words, the word objectivity gets sort of abused a lot. And you, everybody says a journalist has to be objective. And that's never possible because no human being is ever objective. Right. So let's leave that aside. But even when you're writing literary non-fiction, the important thing is not to be objective, but to be fair. You can be fair to all the parties to give them all an equal hearing. You can have your subjectivities in there, as Atish said. Right. And sometimes it enriches the narrative and makes it more meaningful to the reader. Uh, but at the, at, at, you know, in the final analysis, there has to be a certain amount of fairness built into the narrative as well. So what does I, I can hear from you what literature offers journalism in order to turn journalism into literature? You're using tools, techniques, perspectives. What does journalism bring to literature? How does journalism or how do your skills as journalists and uh, Atish, you've been a journalist as well. Yeah, I mean, I've never been, uh, I haven't, I've never been a proper journalist. In fact, the few times that I tried to work as a journalist, I was pretty disastrous because, I mean, I didn't, I was never really a reporter, by, is what I mean. But uh, there was a certain kind of listening that for me uh, was always an incredible relief. Like coming out of a novel where you're, you're sort of, you're at a remove from the world and there's a kind of isolation and you can start to feel like the whole process is becoming corrosive and you're sitting at home spinning your guts and suddenly you're out in the world and you're able to listen with the same concentration as you would follow a narrative in a novel. For me, um, that... And, and you know, it, it, it's in a sense... Um, as you become... As you get to know yourself better and you move past your direct material, your ability to see, at least for me, uh, the pattern of your own experience in the lives of other people, and, and it's not everything that, that matters. You know, it's not, you, I, can't, I can't do nonfiction anywhere. It's certain stories that you look for. Just as you look in fiction, it's certain things that you think, ah, I could come in here, I could listen to these stories, and I would have something to say about it, you know? And uh, I can't tell you, I'm too young a writer to tell you how it will enrich me in the long run, how later, what, what it will do for... But I have a secret feeling that, uh, that, that the material with the light of 10 years or 15 years on it will appear to me in a different way and it might stir the fictional imagination as well. Now, when you're writing your fiction, do you also wear a reporter's hat? Because a lot of your fiction is very rooted in, in the world that we live in, the political realities, social realities, tell me what cultural you, tell realities. Tell me what you mean by wearing a reporter's hat. Like, what do you have in mind? I, I'll let them tell you. They're the reporters. Okay. Uh, trying to recreate things as they are, as they, you see them in a fair way, getting the details right, uh, making sure that it's accurate. So I, 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 it's more like I, I used to be a fact checker for Time magazine and uh, I think that a certain kind of detail, for instance, my, my new novel which is uh, very much wrapped up in the world of Sanskrit, I would, never, I, that I, would, I would make sure that the grammar and everything I was dealing, a certain kind of detail must be right, especially uh, even if you're writing a novel, it sh there shouldn't be an obvious error. But... But that's for the sake of internal consistency, right? So, for example, if you have a Sanskrit scholar as your protagonist, as you do, the Sanskrit scholar, being a scholar, will know his Sanskrit. Right. So you can't kind of put the wrong Sanskrit in his mouth. That wouldn't right. happen, right? But if you're talking about a place, for example, you know, do you feel... I mean, you write about Delhi a lot, so let's take that. I mean, do you feel that you have to get the geography exactly right? Or do you feel that, you know, you can kind of... No, I think that actually, and I remember this... Uh, I remember that there's a certain kind of like, if, if you don't leave the world of nonfiction enough, there are too many elbows. You know, you need actually, I feel in fiction, to write about a place as the impression settles in you. You know, not to write about, you're not, um, in fact, too close, uh, uh, fiction that's too closely mapped, even with research sometimes for a novel, those heavily researched novels, they, they, they carry the, they, 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 they starts to feel something schematic about them. They start to feel heavily, I, I feel that you must allow a certain kind of distance that comes with the imagination to work on your material. And if it is impressionistic rather than accurate, 
probably a very good thing. And that actually counts for literary nonfiction also because, I mean, we're leaving aside for the purposes of this discussion, we're leaving aside academic books, okay? And we're leaving aside sort of hardcore history books, for example. Yeah. But if you're talking about literary nonfiction and the word literary comes in and does the same kind of work, it kind of starts to make the material a little less dense, a little more impressionistic, a little... And so I think the, the, the method of approaching the underlying factual material must be the same. Okay. Yeah. Oh, we're done here. Okay. We, we just decided so that's I, the... No, I'm, I'm always Fox because sometimes I wonder that, you know, why is it so important to be so accurate in fiction particularly? Because if a place exists, the reader knows it. I mean, you know, what great job am I doing by describing it in perfect detail, what these trees are and what the leaves are and so on? No, actually, like, if you were working with a certain, if you valued certain things like economy and stuff, I mean, one of the, the wonders of Russian literature, for instance, is that, you know, there'll be a coat hanging in the room and the scene is complete, you know? And, and so that, that ability for the imagination to actually cut out certain things and not have, for instance, that it says gate number four here and that the, the shutters are red and such, you know, you would, that, that's, that, that filter that the imagination brings to the material is, is like an absolutely essential part of its work. And it, it happens again in nonfiction. I mean, you're right. I mean, so for example, in, in the book, when I had to write about Jaffna, now Jaffna is a town that you can describe in various ways. I mean, and there is a very factual way of describing Jaffna where you can say it is a town with a population of so many people spread across so many square kilometers. This is the main road and so on. But when I had to write about it in the way that we think of literary material or literary technique, I had to think of, again, this question of mood. How do you create yeah. the mood that you want the reader to feel? And my answer was, or one of the answers that I found was to kind of focus on, you know, its geography, its topography. It's very flat. It's flat as if it's been planed, you know, down to the ground so that when you look at the ground and the sea, they're almost the same. It's very stark. Yeah. You know, the trees are straight. The heat is white always. The land is flat. So that starkness gave me a certain mood that I wanted to set for... Yeah to then situate, you know, the birth of the tigers and so on in that geography. By the way, just as an aside, Samant has a particularly rich landscape to work with because I've traveled in, in that part of the world and as you're leaving the, the forests in the center of Sri Lanka, in central Sri Lanka, and, you're, and there are many antiquities, there's this Polonarua, there's Anuradhapur, and suddenly you come into this landscape, you cross, what is it called, the Northern Defense Line or something? Is that the... Yeah, and, and suddenly there are these Palmyra palms which are already like an integral part of the geography and you enter a kind of forest of decapitated Palmyra palms which were decapitated by the aerial bombing as they were coming for the... And uh, it's one of the most disturbing, unsettling scenes I've seen physically in a long time. I mean, it, it's, it made for literary nonfiction. But let me, I mean, this is for both of you because... Um, uh, Salil, you've written about an event that happened in 1971 or thereabouts and after that, a few years later. So you've acquired that certain historical distance to be able to write a book which presumably can afford to speak for itself for some period of time. Um, whereas uh, you're writing about, about contemporary events. So how do you expect your book to stand five years from now? And what did you do to make sure that that happens five years, ten years? You know, I mean, this is already, I mean, it's a good question and it's very relevant because the book is now, I mean, in September it will be published in the United States. And already things have changed. Mahinda Rajapaksa is no more the president of Sri Lanka. So I have to sort of, sort of you know, in the preface of the book I have to insert this or whatever. But again, this is the, this is why you try to make a non-fiction book, a sort of literary non-fiction book, because you feel that, what, what do you want to capture? You want to capture what a certain place and a time was like for the people living there. And if you do that in a, if you do that in an effective and deep enough way, it doesn't matter that it, you know, that events have moved on since then because people will still read it to know what Sri Lanka was like from 1983 to 2009 or 2012, which is when my book ends. And it performs a very valuable service in doing that. And people will read it and then people will kind of extrapolate, you know, sort of trends in Sri Lankan society that may still be found there today or may have changed or may have morphed into something else. I mean, so in that sense, it does, it does the work of sort of almost, a, almost narrative history uh, because you can then kind of pull elements back into your own time. I, I want to ask them both one question. What about the survival, the shelf life of fiction versus nonfiction? Because I agree with you, this, the killings in Trinidad, like I mentioned, death in the afternoon, certain things, 
there's no question about it. They survive like novels survive. Do you have a fear, though, that, that, not, that, that it, it is harder to make a work of nonfiction survive? Like, does it worry you? I had it slightly easier than Samant has on this issue, frankly, because precisely what Arunav said, that I was writing about events that occurred 40 years ago. So quite clearly, I have ended up, because I wasn't there then. I mean, I was an 11-year-old schoolboy in Bombay when the war was going on. So I wasn't there then. So what I, was, I ended up doing essentially is relying on people's narratives and memories of things that had stayed with them all this time. Right. But it also meant, and this is where it gets interesting, unsaid stories. Yeah. See, one of the, the, most, the most difficult chapter for me to write was about the rape of women. There were something like at least, my, I mean, my personal estimate is that at least quarter million incidents of rape took place during that war, right? Now, I mean, obviously there's no evidence left. There's no forensic evidence. The record keeping that was done, everything was burnt away. So you, all you heard was a woman's word. The rapist wasn't around anymore because he was either dead or he was a Pakistani soldier back in Pakistan, yeah. or a collaborator whose name nobody knows. So how do you go beyond it? And therefore what I did was that I, I, I have 28 such accounts in the book, but what I did was that I let them speak their story, and in a way, did away with the details and essentials, and focused on the bigger story, what was done to them, what they underwent, what, and how the society treated them later. Yeah. And I think that, and, and for that reason, and, and, and in a way, since that was what I was writing all along when I came to Shahbagh, I intended, I ended up focusing on what I thought will be remembered later. Because one of the ways the Shahbag, for those who don't know the Shahbag movement, basically uh, the first judgment was given against a man called Abdul Qadir Mullah, and he was given um, life imprisonment. <clears throat> and a lot of people came to the square in central Dhaka demanding death penalty. They said this was not good enough. And they changed the law so that the prosecutor could appeal for a higher sentence. They did appeal. Death penalty was given and he was subsequently executed. But this took a year-long period. So anyway, so this, this was going on. So, but the way the debate was being characterized by the human rights community as one between those who want to end impunity versus those who feel, let's forgive and forget and move on and build a new Bangladesh. And the way it was being pitted by the jamaat e islami party was that, uh, <laughs> they put it very weirdly, they said that this is a fight between the atheists and the believers. And what struck me was that in the audience, there were these devout Muslim men and women who would at the appointed hour, as soon as the Muezzin's call would come, they would lay out a carpet and they'd start praying. And as soon as it was done, they would get up and say, Pashi Chai, Pashi Chai, uh, demanding death penalty for people who claim to speak on their behalf. Now, I feel regardless of which way it is, that incident and its narration there will probably stand the test of time. So yeah. 20 years later, it will mean something that it was not a simplistic story. And I think to do, to do that, to grab at that type of reality, is I think what probably makes it stand the test of time. Is it, is it not possible that you could actually write a great work of literature which may not be read more than a year later because uh, it's so rooted in what actually happened? I may not even be interested five years from now. Can you think of but what? at this time, it's crucial and you know, it gives me a, a very satisfying experience, much more than, as you said, an 800 word collection of it. I mean, you know, your book can't be replaced by a well curated anthology of newspaper pieces, right? So, can you think of a, I mean, even if you think of a novel, I mean, can you think of a novel or any other work that you would call a great piece of literature that you cannot re read again or nobody can read after a year? I no, can't think of a single No, 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 uh, you're right. Well, yes and no. I mean, sometimes even novels are so rooted in a certain contemporary reality that it loses its, its no, luster No, but, but later. It's, it's, a funny, it's a funny business because you are, it's, you're at once, you're right, in, in, especially in the context of Russia again, you have people completely wrapped up in their material, something like demons in the, by Dostoevsky, whatever, or the idea, completely wrapped up in this like furious debate between Slavophiles and the, and, and, and the Russian liberals. And, and all of this is, you can imagine, it seems quite involved. But the genius of it is that actually, despite being completely immersed in that material, that when fiction is working, when it's really doing its job, it, a very, it doesn't age in that way. So, you then, know, so then maybe the distinction becomes not so much can you read it again, but the reasons that you read it. So there may be a work of not literary nonfiction that you produce in the here and now that is read for the here and now. I believe right now that the Sri Lanka book that I've written is being read because people don't know a lot about, I mean, the actual, just the, you know, the, the, um, the sweep of events. 
if it if it if it turns out to be a book that stands the test of time, ten years down the line, people will read it for different reasons because there are actual human stories in there that you don't necessarily have to read about to know what happened in Sri Lanka. No, not just that. I mean, of course, at one level, the change uh, in the elections has made your book more relevant. But what I'm getting at is that um, the details change, but the truth, the reality remains the same. Right. So that's when it, it, it can be equally valid. But equally, there are great books written about certain specific political and historical events, really good books, which no longer uh, offer... So one example... Mind, because, yeah. yeah, it's an interesting... Yeah, you know, the, the, what, the books about Watergate, for example. Great no, books I, about no, no, that, I would, those I would particular events. Take event. a slight uh, deviation here. I think Watergate books are interesting for two reasons. One, abuse of power as a story. Oh. And two, how meticulously you can be a reporter yeah. as a craft of journalism. But I think what addresses your point are these stories that come in Time and Newsweek type magazine about the making of a president at the end of a campaign, mm. which is immensely fascinating. Yeah. But unless the president is a seminal one, like in a sense Obama is, and in a sense Bush is, I mean, unless it, uh, suppose it's an ordinary presidency, which is not great fun, it may not be ma interesting 20 years from I now. I disagree, I disagree. May not be, that's all Again, I'm there's, an, there's the classic example is this historian called Robert Caro, who is in working I in the United States, books, yeah. who has spent more time writing about Lyndon Johnson's political career than the career actually lasted. Yeah. He is still working on the fifth volume or sixth volume, and he's not done. Now, he has made this his life project for 30 years. Uh, he is chronicling things that are already in Johnson's own sort of memoirs and other people's memoirs at the time. But there is a, I mean, the minuteness and the detail with which he recreates sort of how Johnson performed first in the Texas legislature, then in the Senate, then in the vice presidency, then how he came to the... These are all stories that have been told, um, you know, in various ways earlier, and they are still being told with new richness and freshness of detail yeah. by Caro. Caro's but a I would... Argue, I would, I would I would argue that Johnson is a fascinating person. But, 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 but anybody who becomes but, but, a president is a fascinating but, but, person. But, but, I mean, every but, but, what, became president, he's fascinating for no, that. No, no, but Ca what Caro does is that he uses Johnson as a prism. So it becomes about power, it becomes about the book Master of the Senate, which is his time in the Senate. Yeah. It's as much a biography of the Senate as it is uh, of, of... So he, he, that, that's a very, very interesting example of somebody that uses one person, one portrait, and it becomes a, he becomes like kind of a microcosmic of, of other things about an American reality. Extraordinary achievement. And this is, this is one of the amazing, I mean, you know, I, I keep saying literary nonfiction is amazingly nimble because you can do what Salil said. At, when Obama wins a campaign, you can write a 3,000-word uh, a piece in Time magazine about how he did it, and then a 10,000-word piece in The New Yorker about how it happened. Then you can write a book one year down the line about how it happened. And 20 years down the line, you can write maybe a two-part book again about yeah, how so it happened. So that's my question. There, for example, Rajdeep's book, which has been very successful on the 2014 election. Wait, we're talking about literature, right? <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Um, so, do you think that that's the kind of book you'd go back to if, if 10 years down the line okay. you wanted to understand... I'm not going to walk into this trap. Do you mean go... <laughs> what do you mean go back to? Where is the back? No, 10 years later, if you wanted to understand how... You know, there will be a bunch of people who will not have lived through the elections as adults who might want to know what actually happened back then. Now, would you... No, I mean, that's an example of a book. What I'm saying is, would you read the book that was written in 2014 immediately after the elections? Or would you read a book that's written 10 years from now with that vantage point? So I imagine that the Johnson book you were referring to was written much later, not as a not writing, yeah. yes, but not as a piece of contemporary journalism. No, no, yeah. That's a I, it, yeah. I mean, it's a no. I mean, okay. I'm a, let, let me give you. There's a there's a there's an essay by Norman Mailer called "Superman Comes to the Supermarket." Mm -hmm. This is about I think the man. It's one of the. It's either the Democratic or the Republican National Convention. I know there's a big difference between the two, mm -hmm. but it's written just before Kennedy became president. Norman Mailer goes to the convention and he describes the mood. This was written contemporaneously for a magazine at the time. We can still read it today. Superman Comes to the Supermarket is a classic piece of nonfiction. You can read it and you can understand. There are different things. You, you as a reader in 2014 take away different things from what you know, Mailer's reader back in the early 1960s would have taken away. That's the only difference. But otherwise, it's still readable, enjoyable, rewarding. Let's, let's talk about, for one second, about... India's impatience with fiction at the moment. Like, I feel like people pull me aside every now and then, and they say, don't write a novel, write, write something real. And that, like, there's that, like, funny sense that, that fiction can't do what they want, that, 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 that this sort of business of higher truths, of, 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 of those deep, 
underlying things that fiction can un unveil. Like, I feel there's a certain impatience with it right now in India. People are like, give us, give us something that we can, that, that's giving us real information. And it's a strange transition. And, uh, you know, in the, there's a new Granta India issue out. And Ian Jack makes this um, point in his foreword where he says that in the, I think, mid or late 1990s when they first did an India issue, for, the, for love or money, they couldn't find Indian nonfiction writers writing about India of a certain quality. So they had to rely on sort of foreigners, and the only thing they took from India was fiction. So Arundhati Roy was first excerpted there before the God of Small Things came out and so on. He says now it's the reverse. He's, he's yeah. you know, testifying to what Artis just said, is that you can come to India and you can find tons of people who are writing nonfiction, who want to write nonfiction of a certain quality, of a certain type. But again, with fiction, it's, he found it very difficult now to sort of excerpt. So, it's a, it's so a, what do you think is going on, though? Why, why is this happening? I'm just happy that it's happening. I'm not, sh <laughs> I'm not sure what is going on. I think Pakistanis are writing better novels. <laughs> no, this is, the, this is sad, but I mean, I, I, I don't... What, is, what are we to take away from it? What does it mean about the, the time we live in? I mean, you know, one very simple way to explain it is just that for decades, there's been a huge deficit as far as readable, accessible literary nonfiction goes in India. We've always had novels. We've had good novelists writing in English, but also in other languages. We've just never had this kind of tradition. Yeah, I was going to ask you why all the examples you're citing are American examples. Because before... Why, why, why don't we have anything in India? I mean, obviously we, we've we don't. Never, we've never had a tradition of literary nonfiction at all. I mean, we've had the odd book. You know, Pankaj Mishra wrote Butter Chicken in Ludhiana in the early 90s, I believe, and that's literary nonfiction. We've had... Um, Help me out here. I would uh, suggest Bhopal by Sanjoy Hazarika. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Kuldeep Nair, although it had mistakes, but the judgment, which came out within three or f two months of the elections in 1977. Because, you know, when we were talking about this uh, Caro books, I was thinking of Indian campaign books. And, I mean, I haven't read Rajdeep's book, so I can't comment on it. But I think the best book I have read on the emergency still remains the one that was written within a few weeks, The Judgment by Kuldeep Nair. Because it really explained why India turned against Indira Gandhi. And I think it will continue to get read. I'm, oddly, having said that, I know that it is out of print and someone should probably reprint it now. But that's where we are. And if you remember that time, I mean, I'm probably the oldest among all of us. I remember some of the books that came out at that time. And it's the only one that kind of stays because all the others were the quickie bestsellers, which that's were just publishing yes. bazaar rumors. And that was a quickie as well in that sense. Yeah. And that was a classic quickie because yeah. it came. I remember the elections were March something. Uh, March 25 was mm. the final election mm. day. Mm. And the uh, book came out on the 12th of June, right. which was the anniversary of the Justice Sinha judgment in right. the Allahabad High right. Court. Right. But I think right. also, I mean, these, I mean, these examples we are citing are, in a sense, one-offs. I, mean, I mean, now we are talking about the building of sort of a tradition where there are places where, even when you are not writing a literary non-fiction book, there are places where you can publish essays. You know, that is all only starting to happen now. Before, you know, sort of the early 2000s, there was no sense that you could write a piece above 3,000, yeah. 4,000 yeah. words. Right. Yeah. This book of Bangladesh, actually, two... At least two parts of that book had appeared elsewhere as long essays. One in Caravan, right. one as an introduction to a book of photography about Bangladesh. Right, book, right. Written okay. by Bangladesh. I think we'll move to questions now. I'm sure there are plenty, yes. Starting with the front row and then the second row and then the fourth row. Oh, the okay. Illustrated Weekly was it. That's the only place I think illustrated where you could pop, weekly, but that's yes. it. Okay. All right, the lady in the front row, can, can you give her a mic, please? Well, I would like to ask, not particularly any one person, because... Uh, all of you are writers and has, you have a journalistic background. Uh, one thing I would like to, I'm a journalist myself, a freelance journalist, and uh, journalist means they think only reporters, but, uh, but journalists are also feature writers. So that's what I keep saying whenever I give a lecture or whenever I write something. Uh, so what I would like to know is, literature, uh, journalism is literature in a hurry. That's said, I think Matthew Arnold said that. So we do have verisimilitude and creativity involved in both. They are both creative. People who write literature are creative and people who write fiction are also creative. So where do they meet? And where is this question of reality? Because both have to do with people and people would relate to people and they draw inspiration from people's lives as well as uh, from other books they read. So don't you think there's a meeting point and and both require a lot of creativity and vessel in right, the characters. Alright, thank you. Can I ask Atish to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Okay, rephrase the question for me. Well, you know, because you're the novelist. I mean, versimilitude and creativity, where do they meet in the work of a journalist and the work of a, a creative writer, a, a literary writer, let's say? Um, you know, I, I, I would still maintain that, that, that 
it's the lens, it's the way that you look at material, the way that it affects you. It's those things that's really like, the, and, and the, whatever nurtures that, whether it's experience, whether it's reading, whether it's a special set of circumstances that have put you at a certain angle, that's where, and, and, and you can, that lens can be just as fertile if you're traveling and writing in, in, in a literary nonfiction way, um, as, as opposed to if you're, if you're like actually in, in the business of invention. So uh, I feel it's in, the, in that regard that, that, that these things, that, that, that it, it, I, wouldn't, I don't even think of it as changing the lens. It's just that in one, in one business, you're actively listening, you're act actively like dealing with the external world, and the other, you're turning inwards. All right, that's great. Thank you. Okay. Hello, can I uh, make my comment? Yes, no, we have someone. They can, can we have the questions, Chris, please, so that we can accommodate more questions? Yes, second, the lady uh, in the second. I have a question. Yes, uh, sorry, where are you? I have a question. Ah, okay. I think whether it's uh, one is fiction and other is the journalistic genre that we are talking about, both have, uh, have their own impact. Uh, there are people who are moved by a narrative and there are people who are impacted heavily by data that comes in the form of a verified report. Both ways, the writers have a certain accountability towards the readers. So my question to you is, which of the two accountabilities is uh, a greater burden to endure, if at all there is any difference in terms of the ethical accountability that rests with the writer, whether you are a fiction writer or a journalist? Okay, but I'm going to have to ask one of the non-fiction writers to answer that. Oh, I would say the journalist. It, I mean, definitely. I mean, the kind of account accountability you have to portray facts as you see them, to not make anything up, to be fair. I mean, these are sort of, uh, I mean, these are, these are your biggest burdens and they are ones you have to carry sentence by sentence in a way, uh, word by word in a way. In, the, in a way that a non novelist does not necessarily have to right. do Right. Novelists can add imagination. Right. Both have perspective, can, but novelists have imagination. And they can look at the raw data and throw things out that right. don't fit with the narrative, which some people call that journalism. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> All right, sorry, yes. Uh, I want to make a comment on Saman Subramaniam's... Okay, uh, excuse me, if it's not a question, we'll take the comment at the end. Huh? Because right now we are taking questions and answers. We'll come back to you, sir. Yes. Yes, over there. Okay, the, uh, so it very ominous. you have, okay. um, for example, ultra-long form uh, writing... Sorry, who's speaking? Yes, yes Suresh here. You. So, you essentially have uh, ultra long form writing, which is where uh, you take a piece in Caravan or Open or The New Yorker and expand it into a book. Both of you come from such uh, backgrounds, uh, Salil and Samad. And you, for example, have uh, literature that is uh, rooted in a certain uh, period like uh, Dr. Zhivago from the Russian Revolution instead of the Sri Lankan or uh, Bangladeshi conflicts where there's a fictional protagonist versus real people whose lives reflect what is going on uh, and that provide you a human element. How do you contrast the two? I'm, I'm, what you're saying is that there, have, there has been fiction written about the conflicts and what we have done as journalists. And where is the difference between them? Is that, is that what you're Yes, Sorry. because uh, that is fairly close to reality if you look at it and uh, you might uh, change names uh, to protect people's privacy, for okay, example. Yes. So I didn't or, do that. I mean, what I did was the only people whose names have been changed were the women who had no, the fiction. Experience. I mean, what, uh, the, your original interpretation, what is the difference between the fiction that comes out of the same, same theatre that you've written your non-fiction? Okay, of? so, I mean, in Bangladesh case, I mean, there are two, there, there's a lot of literature in Bengali, in Bangladesh that has come out. And I have had it read for me because my reading is very slow in Bengali. And I'm told it's what, uh, you know, in a very memorable phrase, Adil Jasawala described as a poetry that came out of the wars in India, patriotic rubbish. That's what he used to call it. And there is an element of that uh, in, in the context of the writing that has come out of it. In terms of serious fiction about the war, there is, of course, Tamima Anam, Adib Khan. And uh, there is um, Zia Hadar Rahman also touches upon it very, very briefly. And there have been stories of Mahmood Rahman. And all of them are trying to capture slices. I think Tamima started out to do the Grand Canvas novel. And some people, and she's a good friend of mine, but some people have found certain factual details wrong. And they thought, thought that was a problem. I mean, one person said that she had put the two hostels, or which are opposite uh, each other, alongside each other. And that rankled to people. So I think what tends to happen is that we are still at a very early stage 
or seeing the kind of fiction that can come out. One, um, one amusing anecdote I can share is that while I was writing the book, a lot of people told me fantastic, unsubstantiable rumors about Bangladeshi politicians. And what I'm going to do is that I have a friend who's writing a novel about the war, and I'm going to tell him all that gossip, because then he can write it, but I could not. <laughs> yes, the lady in the second row. Yes. Yeah, just say. <clears throat> Um, so, you know, thinking about the accounts that you mentioned, the Lyndon Johnson, the uh, essay by Norman Mailer, would you say that to make nonfiction enduring, adding a more subjective element makes the difference? It helps. I mean, because what subjectivity does, it, it allows you to engage with sort of underlying factors and underlying, to return to that word again, truths. Uh, because, you know, these are things that are never visible. It's not like the underlying sort of dynamics of the Republican National Convention will parade themselves before you that you can just describe them and, you know, you're done. You have to kind of sense things. You have to uh, intuit things that may not necessarily be there in front of you. And that starts to require a certain amount of subjectivity. But, the, the, but when you start engaging with that kind of thing, immediately it starts to become more enduring because those underlying factors are the things that endure over, you know, a decade or two decades or three decades. You know, I'm reminded of, I don't, uh, I think it was Michael Hur's dispatches, well, I may be wrong, but it was the first sentence of an essay that just said, General so-and-so had a light breakfast and went and bombed 25 people. And you know, that, that, that… Which is like the opening line of a novel. Yes, which is like the opening line of a novel, but it stays. Yeah. So subjectivity, and I suppose. Wagner, you know, listening to Wagner and then yeah, Nepam. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and neither of the, I mean, both are, both are true facts, as Absolutely. it were. But bringing them together is what creates the subjectivity. Yes. Yes, yes, all right. Yes. I want to make a comment uh, on what uh, Ian Jack said in his foreword. Uh, in the 50s and early uh, 50s and 60s, though all the problems that we see, we see now were there also, like corruption and misgovernance, but the government was telling the people, we are engaged in developing it. Don't criticize us. It was some kind of a, a total opaqueness and the blankness which the, the citizenry also accepted. My point is, if we had been as awake then as now, we would be a better country. We would be like Singapore or America even. Why that critical sense was not there at that time? Because we blindly believed that our leaders were delivering us for development and we should not criticize them. But sir, that, but sir, Granta doesn't do Singapore issues, that's why. <laughs> so, from a literature like, point like, of view, we like, are better Like off. that very funny story with Mrs. Gandhi and Lee Kuan Yew, he tried to give her some advice and she said, why are you asking me, you run a supermarket, I run a country. <laughs> Oh. Right. Any, any further questions? Uh, one more question. Yes, please. Uh, Who are you? Uh, uh, me. Ah, okay. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, what about Irom Sharmila? Is she a subject to work with for journalists or fiction writers? Sorry, I missed that. What Irom Sharmila. Oh, right. Irom Sharmila. Yes. Make her up. I mean, no, you can't make her up. Yes, but she deserves a book. Of course she? she does. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. If I didn't have two other plans, this would have been the fourth on my list as the next one to get in. But you're absolutely right. It deserves... Uh, respectful treatment because it, she, she raises so many issues, not just the Armed Forces uh, Special Powers Act, but even the who, who, who is in control of your life and can you choose to end it or not. There are deeper philosophical issues there. All right, any further questions? I mean, all, all of them are available now. They'll be signing their books and you can grab them by their collars and beat them up. Yes, yes, please. Oh, well, one last question. Yes. I have a question. Uh, so, so, in when you write, sorry, uh, there's a question here. Oh, we'll listen to both of you, and maybe they can answer afterwards if we're out of time. Yes, quickly, please. Yes. Yeah, sir. regarding the longevity of a nonfiction, uh, I think the times with changing times, uh, nonfiction becomes relevant. Like uh, the case of what in Bangladesh happening now makes uh, Sir's novel uh, relevant. And with the change in government in Sri Lanka, once again makes uh, uh, sure. yes, this absolutely. novel relevant. Events can so, make them relevant. Yeah, quite yeah, right, so. quite right. Okay, the gentleman at the back, one last question. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, my question was, what is the extent of caution that you take because subjectivity quite often becomes self-indulgence because a lot of times the first person singular account of your reportage in the New Yorker or caravan or whatever you yes. write. Yes, what, what do you do? How do you ensure you don't get 
Um, no, it's a fine balance, and you know, it's 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 sometimes uh, e even that is subjective. The role of subjectivity <laughs> is also subjective. You know, I wrote a I wrote He's a, a journalist. I wrote a book review recently for Caravan. This was about this was uh, last year, I think, or earlier this year, in which I opened with sort of a. Uh, you know, my experiences with this particular musician that I was writing about, this person who had written the book. And a certain person on Twitter complained that, you know, this is a really cliched way to start a book review I and mean, why do you always have to delve into it in this subjective way where you kind of get into it saying that, I know it's you, that's why I'm citing this example. <laughs> this was him, that was the guy who complained. So anyway, so, so, you know, but it's subjective, you know, but I felt that it had a certain, it had a certain role to play. It, it, it eased the reader into the material, but it also eased the reader into the place that I was coming from when I started talking about this musician's book. And just to build on that and uh, where, where it is necessary to bring one in or not, I have a very close friend in Bombay called Kalpana Sharma. She's a fantastic writer on environmental and gender issues. She read my book and her response was that we've always been taught, Salil, that you know when you write, you take yourself away and let the, the, the person speak. And she read my chapter on rape actually and that's what we were talking about. That why is it that you have to inject yourself in? And I thought there was a very necessary question, a right question to ask. I didn't explain it but I thought my text did it. The reason was very clear that I was a male, I was not a Muslim, I was an outsider, not a Bengali, coming into a country and asking very probing personal questions to women who were rural, some of them were illiterate, who had never spoken to a journalist before and who had no idea what I was going to do with their stories. And I was going with humility, very aware of what Janet Malcolm has said about, you know, the trickster and journalist who comes and then, you know, takes away the story and acts like a shyster and, you know, cheats the person. So the fact that I went through in my mind, I, I felt it necessary to tell the reader so that the reader would know that I was not the kind of journalist that Edward Baer warns about. Anyone here been raped and speaks English? Thanks. All right. Thank you, Salil. Thank you, Saman. Thank you, Atish. And I really recommend that you buy their books and get them to sign it. These are excellent books. Thank you. Thank you.